Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like thank to uh, organizing committee for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, so to, uh, my topic is ATT induced hepatotoxicity. I would like to discuss under following headings, uh, how common the problem is, how we define uh, ATT hepatitis, what is the pathophysiology of ATT hepatotoxicity, what are the risk factors, how we can prevent and what are the treatment options. And once ATT hepatitis results, so how to reintroduce uh, ATT? So uh, TB is common in India, it is endemic. Uh, according to India TB report 2022, uh, 1.93 new, uh, million new cases were reported in 2021. Uh, globally around one fourth our cases are reported from India. So uh, India is huge burden of TB. And uh, ATT, so first line ATT are uh, uh, isoniazid, rifampin, and pyrazinamide. Three uh, drugs are hepatotoxic out of the first line ATT. And uh, uh, around 10% of patients may develop ATT induced hepatotoxicity. So we have huge burden of uh, TB and uh, there's huge burden of ATT hepatotoxicity. So this uh, uh, study, uh, Indian network of drug induced liver injury. Uh, from multi, this is multicentric study and uh, it has reported uh, anti-tubercular anti drug is the commonest cause of drug-induced liver injury in India. Uh, around 46% patient of DLE uh, uh, is because of uh, anti-tubercular drugs. And the important thing is that anti-tubercular uh, uh, drug associated DLE uh, has high mortality, is independent predictor of mortality or liver transplantation. Definition of ATT uh, delays, if patient asymptomatic, then transaminases level of more than five times. If symptomatic, then transaminases level of more than three times is defined as ATT induced hepatitis. Symptoms could be non-specific in form of anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and pain abdomen or jaundice. If bilirubin more than two times upper limit of normal, then it is uh, independent. Uh, this is single criteria which, by which we can define ATT hepatotoxicity. There's no time limit for uh, ATT hepatotoxicity. It can occur at any point of time, even with first week till six months of ATT. But majority of cases are uh, occur within first two months. So uh, frequency, how frequent deal is around five to 10% of patients may develop ATT hepatotoxicity uh, with isoniazid, rifampin, and pyrazinamide. Uh, Alone isoniazid can cause hepatotoxicity in up to 0.5% of patients. Alone rifampin up to 0.5% of patients, but combination of rifampin and isoniazid can cause hepatotoxicity in 2.5% of patients. Important thing is that 20% uh, of patients may have abnormal LFT, not uh, in the definition of ATT hepatotoxicity, means uh, two to three times elevation or without symptoms. This is known as adaptation. Even on continuation of ATT, LFT is resolved by time. So just abnormal LFT is not the ATT hepatotoxicity, if two to uh, less than five times without symptom or less than three times with symptom, then it is not ATT hepatotoxicity. Uh, not all zondis uh, are because of ATT hepatotoxicity. We have to exclude other causes. Commonest is viral hepatitis. Other are other drugs like uh, complementary and alternative medication and anti-epileptic drugs can cause uh, uh, abnormal LFT in these patients. If patient has underlying liver disease uh, other than chronic viral hepatitis and alcoholism like autoimmune hepatitis, sometimes in patient with concomitant HIV and uh, hepatitis B or C infections, then immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome can also can cause jaundice. Other TB related like granulomatous hepatitis also uh, present with jaundice. So baseline LFT and uh, if there's imaging evidence of granulomatous lesion, then we can uh, say that because of uh, granulomatous hepatitis, uh, jaundice is because of granulomatous hepatitis. Sometimes if large lymph node, which uh, portal lymph node can cause compression of CBD and which can result in cholestatic jaundice. So imaging should also be done before labeling these patient ATT hepatoxity. But main thing is that any patient on ATT, if symptoms or jaundice, then ATT should be stopped and all these etiological workups should be done. 
if anything is positive, then we can level that because of uh, these etiology uh, zones is there. Otherwise, ATT hepatotoxicity is the cause. Uh, this study uh, reported that in one fourth of the cases, uh, jaundice could be because of other reason uh, in these patients, commonest is viral hepatitis, then HIV, alcoholism, and other drugs. So what is the mechanism of uh, TB delay? So uh, ATT delay is because of idiosyncratic injury. It is not dose dependent. It is dose independent. It depends on the genetic and uh, uh, environmental factors and host related factors like uh, age, gender that I will discuss in uh, subsequent slides. The idiosyncrasy could be of two types, metabolic idiosyncrasy or immune mediated idiosyncrasy. Met metabolic idiosyncrasy is if uh, it is because of metabolite which are toxic and these toxic metabolite, they form, uh, they bind with proteins they, uh, and these drug protein adduct, they can cause direct uh, tissue injury and they can lead to immune activation, innate immune system activation, and which can lead to immunological injury. Uh, in pyrazinamide, ATT uh, toxicity is dose dependent. If more than 40 milligram per kilogram dose are used, then it can, uh, the chances of hepatotoxicity are more. But even on doses that we use 25 to 30, then in on the, the, these doses also uh, hepatotoxicity can occur. So idiosyncrasy as well dose dependent toxicity in case of pyrazinamide. This, uh, uh, diagram is showing uh, metabolism of isoniazid. Its main metabolism is an acetyl transferase mediated by which mainly non-toxic metabolites are formed. But uh, minor pathway is this uh, hydrolysis. So it is not much important in normal acetylators, but if patients are slow acetylators, if an acetyl transferase activity is low because of uh, this mutant type of uh, uh, an acetyl transferase, then this pathway becomes important. Another thing is rifampicin increases activity of the cytolytic pathway. Also, rifampicin increases activity of cytochrome uh, 2E1 pathway. So both can lead to accumulation of toxic metabolites. That's why hepatotoxicity is more with uh, combination of isoniazid rifampin rather than isoniazid alone. In case of rifampicin, it activates enzyme, uh, pregnant X receptor, which leads to cytochrome P450 uh, enzyme activation, which leads to uh, hepatotoxicity by act uh, accumulation of toxic metabolites. It also inhibits biliary excretion by inhibiting bile salt excretory proteins. In pyrazinamide, as I already said, that dose dependent as well as idiosyncratic uh, ATT can occur, uh, hepatotoxicity can occur. So majority of cases presents within first two months, but ATT hepatotoxicity can present at any point of time. This study from uh, this uh, Devar Bhavi et al. published in Journal of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, they have studied uh, 269 patients with uh, ATT hepatotoxicity and they have reported that uh, majority of cases presented within first two months of ATT, uh, initiation of ATT. Risk factor in various studies, uh, age, advanced age is risk factor because of the altered metabolism and uh, redistribution of drug. Uh, and age, especially more than 60 years, and children, more chances of ATT hepatotoxicity. Frequency is equal in both male and female, but severity is more in female. So, data of uh, ATT induced acute liver failure, both from AMS Delhi and uh, 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 from Bangalore, they were by group. They have reported that. ATT LF is more common in females. 70% were female in both the groups. Underlying alcoholism is can lead to malnutrition and glutathione depletion, which increases hepatotoxicity. Uh, chronic viral infection, hepatitis B, uh, increases the hepatotoxicity odds ratio for hepatitis C and HIV. Malnutrition, if uh, hypoalbuminemia at the starting of ATT, and after starting of ATT, patient is not gaining weight or even uh, if there's loss of weight on ATT, that in, it increases hepatotoxicity. Uh, EMS group also showed that extensive disease or extra pulmonary uh, tuberculosis, it increases risk of ATT hepatotoxicity. And genetic polymorphism in, and acetyl transferase, cytochrome uh, 2 even and glutathione ash transferase, uh, there's risk of ATT hepatotoxicity. ATT hepatotoxicity can present just asymptomatic elevation of transaminases which are uh, uh, detected on routine LFT monitoring. These can cause non-specific symptoms like nausea, vomiting, uh, abdominal pain, anorexia, and if ATT not stopped, then can lead to uh, jaundice and then subsequently acute liver failure. Severe ATT hepatotoxicity is defined as uh, transaminases more than 10 times or bilirubin more than two times. 
Acute liver failure is defined as presence of coagulopathy and antiplopathy, and it can occur in 0.01% of the patients. If patient is underlying chronic liver disease, then ATT can precipitate acute on chronic liver failure. So the main thing is that symptoms are non-specific. We have to uh, identify these patients early, otherwise it can lead to uh, ALF and very high mortality. So uh, this study, which was published in American Journal of Gastroenterology and uh, this uh, Apazel R Consortium, and out of 3,200 patients uh, of ACLF, 10% uh, of the cases cause of acute decompensation was drug-induced liver injury. Out of them, one-fourth of cases was because of ATT. And uh, this ATT-induced acute liver failure, this study from EMS Daily, uh, uh, they have included 12, 23 patients of acute liver failure between 1986 to 2009. Uh, 70 cases was mainly uh, only because of ATT-induced acute liver failure. Out of them, two-third ATT was given empirically. 70% were female. And uh, ALF, because of ATT, had very poor prognosis in form of two-third mortality. Predictors of mortality in this study was bilirubin more than 10.8, prothrombin type more than 26 seconds, and grade 3 or grade 4 hepatic antiplopathy. The Weiser group also reported the similar findings almost. The ATT delay was the common, common out of 516, uh, more than 50% patients uh, uh, of delay was because of ATT. 43% were uh, received ATT empirically. Jaundice was common in 70% of patients, ascites and antiplopathy in one fourth of the patients, and predictor of mortality was presence of hepatic antiplopathy, higher jaundice, uh, coagulopathy, hypoalbuminemia, and raised creatinine. So overall, ATT hepatotoxic, uh, ATT related ALF is the common cause of daily ALF. Two third cases of uh, daily associated ALF was because of anti tubercular drug in India. Women uh, is more commonly affected. Uh, more severely affected actually. Daily incidence is equal in both male and female, but uh, ATT ALF uh, developed more in females. Le uh, majority of patients were aged less than 35 years. Empirical ATT was given in at least one third of the patients. It has high mortality and survival without liver transplant is uh, around, uh, uh, mortality around without liver transplant was two, two third and survival with liver transplant was two third. How we should screen different guidelines recommend, uh, uh, the re recommendation is different with different guidelines. American and British Thoracic Society both, both recommend that baseline liver function test should be done in all the patient before starting ATT. Once patient develops symptoms, then all the guide guidelines recommend that urgent uh, LFT should be done and uh, Yes. So different guidelines recommend uh, screening, uh, how we should screen in these patients for ATT hepatotoxicity. So baseline LFT should be done in all the patients. If patient develops symptoms, then LFTs should be repeated. If baseline LFTs were normal, then uh, only British Thoracic Society guideline recommend two to four weekly LFT. All the rest, all the guidelines don't recommend uh, LFT monitoring. Only patient develops symptoms, then LFTs should be repeated. If baseline LFTs are abnormal, then two to four weekly LFTs should be done in these patients. So uh, the high risk group are uh, patient with chronic alcohol consumption, patient with chronic viral hepatitis, hepatitis B, C, HIV, pre-existing liver disease or patient with previously abnormal LFTs, patient in third trimester of pregnancy and uh, early postpartum and other hepatotoxic drugs. These patients should be monitored closely. Every two to four weekly LFTs should be done. Otherwise, baseline LFT is normal, then these patients should be monitored uh, clinically only. So uh, this study in which LFTs were uh, routinely done at two weeks, uh, and if uh, okay, sir, sorry. So out of 288 subjects, 7.3 percent patient developed daily, but a two-week LFT was not predictor of development of daily in uh, these patients. So uh, routine LFT, uh, LFT monitoring is not advisable. Best thing is edu educate the patient. Once symptoms develop, then these patients should immediately uh, uh, report. And if we talk about if we can prevent these drugs by any chemoprophylaxis, so this small study of 
anacetyl cysteine in patient with more than age more than 60 years and it shows the protective effect of anacetyl cysteine so hepatotoxicity was developed in 37.5% patients uh, without intervention versus uh, none in patient who received anacetyl cysteine but this is only small study and included age more than 60 years of patients once ATT hepatitis developed, then all the primary hepatotoxic, first line hepatotoxic drugs should be stopped. ATT should be modified. Treatment is usually supportive. If severe hepatitis, then anacetyl cysteine infusion should be given. If ALF, then liver transplant is the uh, option. The uh, trials of anacetyl cysteine and silamarine did not support any uh, benefit, no outcome benefit, mortality, uh, liver transplant. They were not different in the, both the groups. Once ATT hepatitis is resolved, means ALT normalized or at least less than two times upper limit of normal, then we have to introduce ATT because the first line ATT are the most effective drug. These are cheaper and lesser side effects. So we have to reintroduce ATT. So American guidelines suggest sequential day one rifampin maximum dose, day eight isoniazid maximum dose, pyrazinamide should be reintroduced on uh, if their initial hepatitis was mild. Uh, and uh, if ATT hepatitis develop even on reintroduce, reintroduction, then last the drug was added should be stopped. Uh, rest all the ATT, uh, all the ATT drugs should be continued. British Thoracic Society recommend incremental dose, if isoniazid at 50 mg day one, then maximum by day four, then rifampin 150 mg day eight, maximum by day 11, and then pyrazinamide 250 at day 15 and maximum by day 18. WHO guideline recommend that all the uh, three drugs can be reintroduced simultaneously. And this study from AMS Daily, SK Sarmaster Group, they have reported that re uh, ATT reintroduction can be done by any of these methods. The ATT daily, uh, recurrence of ATT daily is similar in all the three uh, groups. Uh, in view of constraints of time, I would like to skip these slides, but in uh, ATT in cirrhotics, if child A, then uh, pyrazinamide should be avoided. In child B, then either of rifampin or isoniazid, only one hepatotoxic drug should be given. And in child C, cirrhotic, all the hepatotoxic drugs should be avoided. Definition is somewhat different in uh, cirrhotic patient. So in conclusion, uh, India is high burden of tuberculosis and ATT daily results in significant mort morbidity. Patient education is important for early diagnosis because once patient develops severe hepatotoxicity, outcome is poor. And predictors of poor outcome are jaundice, bilirubin more than 10.8, uh, coagulopathy and hepatic encephalopathy. Empirical ATT should be avoided. Thank you. I would like to invite Dr. Ashi Ken, who is an associate professor in the Department of Critical Care Medicine from Mahatma Gandhi Medical College Hospital. He would be talking about TPN and Jotis. Thank you, Chairpersons. My topic of discussion is TPN and jaundice. The long-term parental nutrition was first introduced by Dr. Stanley Dutrich in 1960. And uh, in 1968, he discharged his first patient on long-term home parental nutrition, which lived, who lived around 15 years on parental nutrition. But uh, immediately after a few years in 1971, Patton et al. recognizes that long-term parental nutrition can cause hepatobiliary complications. Nomenclature is a bit confusing because a lot of terms is being used. Parental nutrition associated cholestasis, primarily which happen in uh, pediatric age group. PNALD, which is characterized by inflammation causing cholestasis, st steatosis, and uh, resulting in fibrosis and cirrhosis, primarily seen in adult patient. According to Aspen, 2018, all these three terms, PNAC, IFALD, and PNFLD can be used interchangeably. But in 2020, uh, ASPAN, they say that PNAC should be used for preterm babies and pediatric age group, while PNALD and IFALD can be used interchangeably. Epidemiologically, infants are more prone to develop these hepatotoxicities due to parental nutrition, and it is uh, approximately 60% of uh, pediatric population are affected. 
Premature newborns with low birth weight are more prone and the duration is also important. So if you see, if the duration is more, uh, is, is increasing, the chances of getting a uh, TPN associated liver disease is rising from 30% to 70%. Mortality among infants is around 40%, while in adults it is around 22%, while uh, it is a major cause of pediatric liver transplantation. The mechanism is still unclear. It is multifactorial. A lot of these factors are involved, which involves prematurity, duration of parental nutrition, lack of enteral feeding, small bowel bacterial overgrowth, sepsis, clepsy, intestinal failure, various surgical procedures, and various components of parental nutrition in, with the uh, change in the gut microbiota and uh, increased bile lithogenicity with subsequent bile duct obstruction. And these all will lead to the development of inflammation, which will call, uh, cause liver, uh, liver failure and liver injury. In a normal uh, adult, the bile acid, which is present in gut lumen, it bound to personide X receptor, FXR, and cause activation of fibroblast growth factor, which reaches to liver via the portal vein, and it causes down-regulation of bile salt synthesis by decree, by uh, uh, negative uh, effect on the cyto uh, this uh, cholesterol 7 alpha hydroxylase. And it also affects the lipid profile and the glycemic control. While in gut, this primary bile acids is converted to secondary bile acid with the presence of normal fermenters gut microbes. If there is change in the gut microbiome or if there is gut injury, causing release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, tumor necrotic factor alpha, they cause this increased inflammation, uh, loosening of the tight junctions, more sepsis and gut and liver injuries. The infection primarily related to either gut bacterial translocation or it is catheter related but is stream infections. Because of the infection, there is release of uh, increased lipopolysaccharides, which, which will uh, act on the macrophages, cofer cells, they release interleukins, they release tumor necrotic factor alpha, act on the hepatocytes, and they cause down regulation of the bile salt transporters. So there is a collection of bile salt or cholestasis, which will lead to further inflammation and the injury. Similarly, when there is uh, damage to the gut barrier and there is a dissociation of structural Z Z01 and uh, claudins that are the tight junctions, it causes increased septic episodes in the patient on uh, parental nutrition. So uh, when there is a uh, loss of gut microbiota, there is a uh, loss of secondary bile acid precursors. So increased primary and to secondary bile acid ratio that will lead to increased bile synthesis and cholestasis leading to liver injury. Similarly, when there is dysbiosis or the shift of the proteobacteria and the bacteroids, that means harmful bacteria are there in the gut, they increases the pro-inflammatory cytokines causing endotoxin and bacterial translocations and injuries. It is also associated with what we eat. If we are taking anything from the mouth or enterally feed patients, the fermentacus uh, is the predominant group of microbiota, but in starvation or patient on TPN, it is the proteobacteria and the actinobacteria who are prominent, and it, this change is causing the problem. Similarly, in fasting patients, there is a suppression of various hormones, which will lead to decreased stimulation of the bile flow, decreased intestinal motility, leading to bile stasis and bacterial overgrowth. Similarly, in the short bowel syndrome patient also, we are giving a lot of uh, feed to them. There is increased uh, glucose, increased indigested flu uh, food. So there is decreased pH, uh, fecal pH, and there is increased oxygen concentration. Both of these will lead to gut inflammation and increased intestinal permeability leading to infection and cholestasis. Certain nutri nutri nutritional deficiencies are also associated with the parental nutrition, uh, which is vitamin E, glutathione, carnitine, choline, and taurine, out of which uh, most of them are, uh, when they give as a supplement, they are not uh, showing any decrease in the level of uh, hepatic enzymes except choline. And uh, choline, glutathione, and taurine, these are uh, the, these are the, uh, formed in the liver by the methionin with a uh, reaction called hepatic transsulfuration. Nutritional toxicity is also a, 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 a risk factor. When we give parental nutrition is high in calories and it causes increase in portal insulin and glucagon ratio, 
and uh, it which causes mitochondrial carnitine acetyl transferase activity which decreases the fatty acid oxidation similarly high lipid content more than 3 grams per kg per day if it is given it causes cholestasis and lipid overload syndrome cholestasis thrombocytopenia and dic if lipid emulsion is made up of soya bean soya bean is very rich of omega 6 fatty acids along with phytosterols and these are hepatotoxic so we need to shift from soya bean based lipid solutions to fish oil based lipid solution which is rich in omega 3 fatty acid which has anti inflammatory activities and omega 3 pufas <clears throat> decreases the pro inflammatory eicosanoids fish oil also high in tocopherol which is also a anti inflammatory uh, molecule so if you see the composition of uh, various fatty emulsion we use very frequently intralipid which is 100% soya based um, uh, solution so we should avoid and switch over to the fish over uh, fish oil based uh, solutions various uh, component also affects uh, the development of injury that is manganese copper aluminum and chromium that can potentially hepatotoxic and cause the problems how to diagnose uh, parental nutrition associated liver disease if there is 1.5 time rise of two out of three that are ast alt and alkaline phosphatase within the first one to three weeks of start of parental nutrition it can be diagnosed as parental nutrition associated liver disease conjugated bilirubin is a prognostic factor biopsies are uh, can be done um, in infant it is primarily cholestasis with ballooning of the hepatocytes cofer cell hyperplasia and extramedullary hematopoiesis is seen while in adults it is microvascular and macrovascular steatosis along with necrosis peri uh, cellular and perivenular fibrosis and bile duct hyperplasia leading to cirrhosis though the biopsy is not helpful but as per the aspen guideline the decision of a biopsy should be taken on case to case basis classification of pnld is given by bath et al and uh, they divide uh, pnld in three types mild moderate and severe depending upon the biochemical finding ultrasound finding and the histological findings clinically generally patient does not produce any um, clinical feature uh, if they produce it is very late and uh, generally it is cholestasis jaundice or some non specific abdominal pain because of the hepatomegaly but when there is a cirrhosis so the signs symptoms of portal hypertension is a feature varies is called stone ascites is there we should always rule out the other etiologies before dial labeling it as a pnalds and that are any congestive heart failure ischemic hepatitis any hypertrophic hypoxia sepsis any disease related to uh, biliary system cholestasis cholelithiasis drug induced viral and so many and so on so after we have ruled out each and other uh, etiologies and if there is direct bilirubinemia we can go make the diagnosis of pnalds if we come to treatment prevention prevention and management of pnalds are still to be improved still a lot of work is going on but the primary thing is to manage the risk factors we can use ursodeoxycholic acid antibiotics for sepsis and gut uh, infection should be uh, appropriately used supplementation of vitamin e methionine glutathione taurine uh, with tpn is you know it is tested in many trials but they are not found to reduce alt ast ratio in in these kind of patient but when we switch from tpn or parental nutrition to enteral nutrition it is found that the the level of cholestasis the level of uh, transaminases it come down as well as if we supplement choline also along with along with the tpn it is also associated with reduction in the cholestasis but uh, still uh, work is going on on the uh, supplementation of choline then we should reduce uh, the dextrose and the lipid emulsion we should use a newer kind of lipid based uh, parental nutrition formulations which is known as smof and we should change a constant parental nutrition to cyclic parental nutrition weaning should be done as early as possible and transplantation intestinal and liver transplantation combined or alone intestinal transplantation in an appropriate setting should be done aspen says that specialized nutritional protocol Uh, making optimum use of enteral nutrition should be implemented 
and we should limit the use of soya-based lipid formulations. We should give, uh, use more and more lipid emulsion, which has reduced omega-6 to omega-3 UFA ratio. Uh, one study showed that when we uh, change from soya-based lipid emulsions to um, uh, fish oil-based lipid emulsion, the changes and the, in, and the improvement of cholestasis, improvement of hepatic injury is there. And they also recommend that uh, in case of infantry children, lipid emulsion enriched with omega-3 fatty acid should be used. They recommend the use of SMOF, which is a, is a combination of soybean oil, 30%, medium chain triglyceride, 30%, olive oil, 25%, and fish oil, 15%. There is a uh, new SMOF 20 is also there when the com composition is almost same, but percentage is reduced to approximately a five times lesser than this. This is one study which is, uh, which is done using this SMOF uh, parental nutrition and they, it is, and it uh, showed that there's decrease in plasma bilirubin in SMOF lipid cohort versus the placebo cohort. So to conclude, parental nutrition associated liver disease is a potential complication of nutrition therapy in critically patient. And sometimes it is life-threatening requiring uh, transplantation Understanding its mechanism, diagnosis, and excluding other causes of liver injury and the possibilities of prevention and treatment, liver and intestine transplantation may be needed and more research is required. Thank you. Uh, these are the of the department of the last round of the department of the department of the department of the the do you want to present uh, live or can we play the video? Yeah. yeah. Fine. Good afternoon, chairpersons, faculty, and delegates. I thank uh, the organizing committee, uh, Professor Kapoor in particular, for having invited me to give this talk on portal cavernoma cholangiopathy. It was first described in a patient with biliary obstruction because of collaterals in patient with extra hepatic portal injury. It was uh, demonstrated uh, by Williams in 1982. Reversal of biliary obstruction by shunt surgery was shown by Chowdhury et al. in 1988. Endoscopic biliary stenting as a therapeutic modality for this uh, problem was uh, reported in 1993. While the accepted nomenclature is portal cavernoma cholangiopathy, it has been named portal biliopathy, portal hypertensive biliopathy, pseudosclerosing cholangitis, pseudocholangiocarcinoma, vascular biliopathy, ischemic biliopathy, etc. The pathology, pathogenesis, symptomatology, the investigative modalities, the diagnostic algorithm and the management strategy were laid down in a consensus uh, statement, INASL consensus statement in the year 2014. The description of the changes that one would see and the definition criteria were laid down where the typical cholangiographic changes are to be called extrinsic impression or indentations, shallow impressions, irregular ductular contour, stricture, filling defects, bile duct angulation, upstream dilatation, ectasia. One can make this diagnosis provided you have ruled out primary sclerosis.
genesis from the time when extra hepatic portal venous obstruction, a acute portal vein obstruction happens, take several years before established portal cavernomal phalangeopathy findings are seen on imaging. Now, these are because of dilated epicolidocal plexus of saint and paracolidocal plexus of petron, vessels in the bile duct wall and around, which cause obstruction biliary changes secondary to compression in 55% of patients and ischemic strictures in 45% of patients. While extrahepatic portal venous obstruction has been shown to cause biliary abnormalities on cholangiogram in a vast majority, they remain asymptomatic and it's only 20% of patients who develop symptoms such as jaundice, pain and cholangitis. Now there are risk factors like increasing age in patients with extrahepatic portal venous obstruction, uh, dilated CBD, gallstones, CBD stones, but the temporal course in patients with extrahepatic portal venous obstruction is about 8 to 10 years before they become symptomatic. It's patients with uh, jaundice or pain who will be considered symptomatic who might show advanced changes of Polythiasis, splenomegaly, and signs of cirrhosis. Splenoportal axis, which might be helpful if shunt surgery needs to be. Reserved only for therapeutic purposes because of the invasive nature and the risk of complications with this modality. There are grades of changes that are described with ERC, grade 1 which was irregular angulations of the biliary tree, grade 2 indentation.
probability that we should understand that these patients are very high risk. So once yes, you have every patient should be counseled and uh, should be prepared for uh, this liver transplant. If the patient improves, then we can wait for otherwise. What about the continuation of ADD post transplant? Since he is going to be on immunosuppressants, he does not take and was planned for liver transplant. What would you be? What would be your plans? I'm not doing this. Thanks. So, another important aspect here is the uh, compensated civil system. Uh, they are uh, very difficult to diagnose, basically, especially in a situation where a pulmonologist is treating the, these patients uh, with the ATT and uh, for pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, the two guidelines say we just want to do LFT, but they LFT is not a true reflector of uh, uh, cirrhosis. Yeah. They don't go for all the amount of the So then this subset needs to be addressed. Yes, sir. Yes. In American Thoracic Society, they have also recommended platelets should be done in these patients. So the homocyte opinion might be a uh, principle for the hypertension. So yes. Most are not aware, especially for more of the Yes, sir. And for history and physical exam, this is very common aspects of this patient will be missed. So, this is the group where uh, chances of hope if you take toxicity with full dose it is. Thank you, Dr. Shakir. Um, so next talk was on uh, like TPN induced liver injury. This was also a very common topic for us. We deal day in and out like uh, patients who are requiring TPN and uh, we have to like manage those patients as per their LFT values like that goes on. So uh, Dr. Ashish has very nicely covered the topic, sir. Um, I had a few questions regarding this. Uh, similarly, like we have seen patient having normal LFT, like first of all, baseline LFT has to be done in all patients. Then suppose like if a patient is having deranged LFT to begin with or having some liver problem or uh, biliary problem, we have to start TPN. So what should we look for? How will we go ahead with uh, this TPN introduction in this patient? Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if baseline, your liver parameters, all that one thing is if you and the liver is normal, then you can take the normal TPN, which is swap with a containment system. Now, this is a television function, or even a TPN, TMA. Both are very uh, low sodium in baseline. And uh, if after a supplementation, if it is rising, rising more than 1.5 times or 2 times or 3 times, the organ is more than 2 times, please stop it for the next few days. Switch over to either a massive base or you just switch to the or a massive base. Once uh, it has come down to the normal, you need to have a normal thing, please start with your work. So, once patient has developed some liver dysfunction on a TPL, uh, we should completely switch off this TPN and uh, we can with uh, we should uh, give only amino acids or we can give dextrose uh, solutions along with this plus amino acids. The, the situations where this happens, particularly in what's in the bonds, uh, the TPN is really starting the situation like necrotizing and propagating. And then it's actually going on and you are giving TPN. The child develops a safe space site and client prospect elevation or mental elevation. How do they decide this is TPN and use for special solution? I have shown that algorithm. First, we have to know each and every uh, alternate for the size in the liver uh, function. If it is liver function. If it is sepsis, treat sepsis. If it is land-related infection, treat land-related infection. Right? Any other thing to do, which can cause rise in the transplant with the area or rise in the tissue. Once it is done, you will not found any other reason. This is not <laughs> like this, like this, you will be excluded. Um, in simple terms, of what is the thin, simple one or four uh, indication by contraindication of people? In which four type of patient will not be the transplant? So if you can start and treat feet in any situation in the next like 48 hours or 24 hours, these things will start to be number one. Start which is health is one. Number two, start septic patients who are not uh, like having anemia or septicemia, blood stream infection, high acid acid support. So we start it for calorie, you can give that source, but the third is solid liver failure patients. Your uh, active liver failure patient, however, 
in the patient growing blood pulses positive then there is no uh, the dysfunction so the there is the blood line which is there so which you are giving the central line if it is a source change it and then again start the line in new place and then will over this renal dysfunction yeah, I have a question sir uh this uh, TPN usually have three components the peptide, protein, and carbohydrate. So, as far as my understanding is that both lipids and dextrose are heterodoxic, like a deranged or leptin. So, is there anything that this component is more heterodoxic, like they start dextrose and avoid lipids, or we have to stop both dextrose and lipids and just continue on your six? There are a lot of studies which show that the lipid component is more heterodoxic containing the serum. So, the all. And other than the textbooks, textbooks which is given here, it's only the uh, is probably component which is in the form of textbook 25 percent solution around 20 or 30 ml in a 100 ml solution. There. And uh, uh, primarily, energy is given by the uh, uh, lipids, then after carbohydrates, and then the amylase. But if you see, uh, you ask me out of these three, which is more textbook lipid component, okay, then that textbook. Yeah. Um, Another question. Now, uh, from the aspects of the post graduate stress, when they have prescribed a TPN, what should be the degree of test and when the degree of the test should be repeated? Once we have started the patient on TPN. You know, electrolyte, we should involve in the like, uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, reaction, along with the liver function and creatinine. These tests will be done. Triglyceride levels are a little profile. Already first day we can uh, test. And uh, well, after 72 hours, please repeat the electrolyte. If there is derangement, because in ICUs you daily use, uh, do, uh, you are doing ABGs, so for your quotation, you can see their attention, you can get that in the ABG. Creatinine you will have the ABGs, but not the electrolyte there. So we should check. Or if you're doing the diet, or patient is having some problem, then we should. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ashish. Like, while we had these two very common conditions, uh, next talk was on portal biliopathy, which is which seems to be a very complex uh, topic, and especially for residents, postgraduate residents. I really congratulate uh, Dr. Srikanth for comprehensively covering, covering this uh, talk very nicely and uh, like giving brief to these uh, residents uh, nicely. So he's uh, like online. Is he online? Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm online. Yeah. Good afternoon. Sir, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, we had uh, two, three questions like uh, regarding this, like for uh, for the interest of residents. Uh, you mentioned phase one, phase two, phase three. Like in all patients, uh, phase one is endoscopic drainage, endoscopic management of. Uh, this portal biliopathy, or it is a specific subset of portal biliopathy patients where CBD stone is there, cholangitis is there, or there is non shuntable anatomy, then only this uh, endoscopic management becomes a phase one. I would think uh, more majority of the patients uh, need uh, some kind of temporizing, which means you might have a patient who presents with uh, jaundice which is a common presentation of this condition now when you are embarking on let's say it's a patient with only a stricture now it could be because of collaterals uh, compressing extrinsically or it could be because of ischemia these strictures now to address this you might evaluate further find the shuntable anatomy but doing an endoscopic stenting to make the patient jaundice free should be the first step before you proceed to doing a shunt. So in that sense, endoscopy should be the first. Now take the instance of a patient having bile duct stones. Again, an endoscopic approach is required for removal of the bile duct stones by balloon, dormia, and then putting a stent. You may have to deal with the gallbladder now. Again, the, here is where you do a shunt review and then do a gallbladder procedure. So I would think a majority of patients would require. Now consider the situation where a patient presents with pain only. There's no jaundice. 
you might find collaterals you might not find a derangement of a left ear but you have extensive collaterals around gallbladder now this again is a patient where you may consider no endoscopic therapy this might be the exception but for doing a gallbladder you might have to do a shunt and then plan your biliary procedure so i think it needs to be individualized but the thinking should be in terms of issues which are at hand should be if required endoscopic which should be in majority of these strictures stones etc of the biliary tree it is only in a case where there is symptomatic gall stones with the portal cavernoma where you find it's not possible to do a gallbladder surgery without doing a shunt you might uh, avoid endoscopic procedure you're not going to do endoscopic procedure there so largely yes phase 1 should be endoscopic and then a shunt procedure we say a shunt procedure because it decompresses the system here again the challenge is not all patients may have a complete decompression of the portal cavernoma so you may have to resort not to a surgical management of the bile duct stricture you may have to resort to an endoscopic approach in a subset of patients where even after shunt you have a lot of collaterals present not a straight forward problem i think even after several years when we discuss in our interdisciplinary team meetings we do find challenges in coming to a particular solution for uh, there are several combinations several issues with this problem yes definitely sir this is one of the most complex uh, areas in gi surgery so that is why i i to the to begin with i told like this is too complex for uh, pg residents actually Shikan, uh, Abhinav here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, Shikan, the young child, uh, 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 PSTDO portal video patty. No symptoms other than he is faltering on growth. No and symptoms then, other than other than faltering on growth. Hmm. That's central anatomy. Will you do? <coughs> It will improve. Oh, but. by oh, definition so what right, you said is and portal video presentation also what so, what uh, portal video pati presentation in what way asymptomatic symptomatic with asymptomatic asymptomatic so it's very clear that asymptomatic patients the consideration here is not um, portal video pati in terms of you don't have any attributable symptoms to the biliary tree so you are now going to ask me the question whether you are going to consider a shunt i think yeah. you might consider a shunt in a patient for failure to thrive reasons in a pediatric age group that's a different thing altogether now if you leave the failure to thrive aside asymptomatic patients portal biliopathy don't do anything just follow them up that should not be a reason to intervene um any uh... these patients are developing this feature because of either uh, directed veins and ischemia so what is the possible as they know there is a lot of collaterals at the porta still these uh, patient developing ischemic collagenopathy why is this this can develop ischemic collagenopathy in spite of a bigger larger disease mm -hmm. no i didn't get the question what i heard was you have a patient with portal cavernoma why is it that some patients develop ischemic cholangiopathy is that the question yes sir he is asking like um, this bile duct is surrounded by too many collaterals so lots of blood vessels are around even then uh, this bile duct uh, goes into a stricture because of ischemia how does this happen his question is this no first thing is the uh, what data says is you have because of collaterals compressing 55% ischemic 45% now why ischemic see maybe <coughs> the starting point for this whole problem is thrombosis of the portal vein so you could have thrombi developing within these collaterals also and this congestion would lead to secondary ischemia so exactly as it evolves what happens is something one cannot say it is a it is just an interpretation of what perhaps happens 
to develop such tight structures and the bile duct wall here showing no i mean uh, fibrotic walls with no i mean that that's the reason you call it a ischemic structure I, I guess a lot of these factors can work cause ischemic strictures. The, so lots of factors are the there. Difference, but, uh, the difference uh, is that ischemic strictures are tight strictures which don't resolve, for example, with a, a portosystemic shunt. Whereas when you have strictures because of extrinsic compression, they're more likely to resolve after you do a shunt when the portal pressure drops. Uh, so that would be a distinguishing feature in terms of when you see the response to a shunt procedure, a tight stricture likely to be ischemic stricture. For the biliary stricture, which are not responding to shunt surgery and endoscopic therapy, is there a role of metal stent? Mm -hmm. Sir, so he is asking like, is there role of metallic stent in a stricture which is not resolving after decompression? Okay. So first, let us understand phase one. You have in a, a stricture, you have put in an endoscopic stent. Phase two, you have done a shunt and you are coming with a scenario where the stricture has not responded, which means you remove the stabiliary stent and th there is a persistent stricture. How do you deal with this? The standard way to do uh, deal with this is do a hepaticojejunostomy. Because by now, the cavernoma is decompressed, collaterals are gone. Now, how is this evident? You could see this on Doppler, you could see this on imaging, you could see this on Apogee endoscopy, which initially had shown varices, varices are not there. In these situations, you would plan a hepaticojejunostomy uh, in, uh, in, in a patient who has a persistent stricture. Now, is there a minority where you may consider a metallic stent? Let me put it this way. You have a patent shunt, but still stricture not resolved and the collateral still there. That means you can't go in and do a hepaticojejunostomy. We have seen these situations. The option here is long-term long change of plastic stents. Now, metallic stents might have issues in that long the patency of metallic stents is six months to one year. Removal of these stents is dif difficult. You can place retrievable or covered stents, but these are expensive. So in clinical practice, when you have looked at endoscopic stenting, being a benign pathology, you are looking at several years. Metallic stents might have a role in a very small proportion of patients. Maybe those where clearly you have decided you have to go for transplantation. You might put a metal stent for long-term patents, long-term longer patency before you do the transplant. But otherwise, I don't think it is a, a routine to consider metal stents in these patients. It's an exception, not a rule. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for your like uh, very um, like enlightening uh, answers to all these questions. Is there any question from the house? Like, To any speakers? Okay. If there is no question, should we? Chat. Nothing is. There are no more questions. This uh, is part of so that is wonderful. All three speakers did justice with their talks. I thank uh, all three speakers, uh, uh, the person, Dr. Kapoor, and uh, the questioners. This session is closed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.